This is Richard Wolf from Democracy at Work responding to another Ask Prof. Wolf question from our Patreon community. And this question comes from Ryan Kennedy and has to do with Australia and with the two political parties that dominate Australia rather like the Republicans and Democrats do in the United States, the conservative and labor in England and so on. And he asks particularly about the Labor Party and its socialist principles, that word socialism is in their self-definition. And he says, quite rightly, that in the era of neoliberalism, say since the 1980s, uh, the socialism seems to have been pure verbiage because the reality is that they were neoliberal, that they accommodated uh, the neoliberal trend uh, to believe in capitalism, to believe that private enterprise is the solution to our social problems, and liberating the private sector is the way forward, etc., etc. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. And of course, what happened in the Australian situation is very similar to what happened in many other places. And one of the reasons I want to respond is because the issues Ryan raises for Australia apply everywhere. So for example, Tony Blair in England represented the shift away from whatever socialist history the Labour Party had to something that bore no relationship, barely to the socialist movement. Ditto uh, the movement to the center in the so-called democratic centrists of uh, Clinton and Obama. Uh, you see the same thing there. Uh, it explains how you can have a President Macron in France who was a cabinet member of a socialist government and is now governing in a way that has absolutely no relationship uh, to any socialism that I can recognize. Having said that, let me remind everyone that there is no place in the world that gives you a license as to what socialism can, does, or must mean. Socialism is defined by the people who call themselves socialists and by the people who don't like them for calling themselves socialists. It therefore encompasses a range of meanings. So for example, it can mean a very moderate softening of private capitalism a few regulations here or there, a minimum wage, just to make it a little less unequal, a little less harsh than it otherwise is. But there are also socialists who want to displace and replace capitalism with an altogether different system that has working people at the core and in control of the system, uh, not capitalists in that position. Uh, and so socialism has meant different things to different people at different times and in different uh, places. But let me argue that we are at an inflection point that makes the question very topical. The era of private capitalism being in the driver's seat, being in a place where not only the business community cheers it on, but the critics of capitalism the socialists, moderate and not so moderate, got taken in after the 1970s. They felt they had to accommodate that there were problems with the socialist societies then dominated by the Soviet Union, as the great example, and that there were shortcomings in those systems, and there was a surge of economic growth after World War II, on the part of private capitalism, you put all that together, and even the critics of capitalism felt they had to accommodate to the notion that capitalism could and would be some sort of engine of progress, engine of growth, and engine to sustain and support a vast, well-off middle class. All of that is now gone. Yes, the media tried to stall off recognition of it, but most people who pay attention, and certainly the people who run this society, they know. 
it's even so widely understood that in the last presidential race in the United States, a vanishing middle class was on every politician, every candidate's lips. The middle class is over. The capacity of the privately run and dominated capitalist system to support that middle class is gone. But the failures of private capitalism go far beyond that. In the United Kingdom and the United States, arguably the leaders in the neoliberal resurgence after World War II. In those countries, the failure to prepare for and cope with COVID-19 is a stunning demonstration of systemic failure. Their failure to prepare for the major economic depression that has settled in on Western capitalist countries starting in February of 2020 is another sign of incapacity. This is the third crash of capitalism in the 21st century, and the third one was worse than the second, and the second one was worse than the first. This is not a direction you can be proud of. And then there were the fires in California, and then there were the outages of electricity in Texas. Rich, major parts of the United States cannot cope with a public health threat, with a storm threat, with fire, with ice. It's biblical in its proportions. U.S. capitalism and British capitalism are in deep trouble. And in that moment, the labor parties, the socialist parties, are also now going to have to ask if they haven't already, did we accommodate to something we shouldn't have? And even if we defend what we did, isn't it time to accommodate to the failures of that system? to let go the political accommodations we made, to recognize that what the mass of people now want is actually a better way, a better future. The slogan, we can do better than capitalism, has an enormous global audience now. So rather than bemoan the accommodations of the past, even though that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do, I'd rather focus on the future and say, socialism now can be the wave of the future if it acts and insists that it has an alternative way of organizing society so that the disasters of a private capitalist dominated society can be avoided. And I think we can do that. And I think we need to do that because if we allow by not having a massive socialist program, if we just tinker around at the edges, we will not solve the economic decline. And just as the first phase of that brought us Donald Trump number one, if there isn't a socialist intervention and the economy declines because neoliberals can control of the Democratic Party or the Labor Party, etc. Let that happen, hesitate, fail to make the necessary huge structural interventions, then they will prepare the road for Donald Trump's number two. This is Richard Wolff for Democracy at Work.